Drugs, vaccines, and treatments all need to be tested for their effectiveness and safety. It's not always feasible to do this testing directly on living organisms or patients, especially if the drugs you're trialing are experimental. Scientists can isolate cells from organisms and create artificial conditions that mirror what is happening inside our bodies. If the environment around them is carefully controlled, these cells can continually grow and divide, providing researchers with a reproducible way of testing therapies without harming test subjects. Hello, I'm Jack Wang, a microbiologist and science educator based in Australia. This video is the first part in a series on cell culture, where we go through the basic principles of cell handling techniques, in particular resuscitating frozen cells and subculturing cells so that they continue to grow. While these basic principles remain the same, the process may vary depending on the cell type you're working with. If you're interested, you can find links to the other videos in the cell culture series in the description below. Cell culture is very susceptible to contamination. After all, there are no immune cells in our flasks that can defend them from foreign pathogens. Contamination can come from plates, tubes, flasks, equipment or nutrient media, and the scientist. You are actually the most likely cause of contamination. Our safety hoods can lower the chance of contamination by directing airflow from inside of the hood towards the outside. This maintains aseptic conditions within the hood while containing splashes and aerosols you might generate. Before you start, wash your hands to remove possible contaminants. After putting on gloves, spray your hands with 70% ethanol, your best friend in cell culture. Spray and wipe down the hood with 70% ethanol before and after you do any cell culture work. Clean everything you place in the hood with 70% ethanol to prevent introducing contaminants into this sterile space. This includes liquid waste disposal containers, pipettes, flasks, and plates. Every time you take your hands or any equipment outside of the hood, you should respray it with 70% ethanol. The sleeves of your lab coat are an often overlooked source of contamination. Button them down or use masking tape to tape up your sleeves. Most purchase cells will arrive frozen and we keep the vials in liquid nitrogen for long-term storage. When it is time to culture these cells, we need to thaw and resuscitate them carefully. In the hood, twist open the valve slightly and quickly re-tighten the lid. This releases any trapped liquid nitrogen, which could burst the lid open once thawed. Take the valve out of the hood and into a 37 degrees Celsius water bath for about one minute to thaw the cells. Do not fully submerge the valve in the water bath. Use a floating rack to do this. Because you took the valve out of the hood, you need to spray it with 70% ethanol again. To resuscitate the frozen cells, you will need pre-warm media to provide nutrients for the cells, pre-warmed phosphate buffered saline, PBS, to wash off any toxic chemicals and racks and pipettes to transfer liquid to and from tubes and flasks. Spray all of these with 70% ethanol before bringing them in the hood. Add pre-warm media to a sterile centrifuge tube, then pipette the entire contents of the thawed vial into it. Try to pipette down the side of the tube so that the media gently drip to the bottom. Note that different volumes will require different pipettes. Larger volumes, 5, 10, or 25 mil, rely on motorized pipette controllers with single-use pipettes. Next, we will try to wash up any chemical cryoprotectant that may be toxic to the cells. Centrifuge the cells for five minutes, and the cells are now pelleted down to the bottom. Pour off the old media and resuspend the cells with fresh warm media by gently pipetting the media in and out of the tube. This suspension of cells can then be added to a dish or flask. Gently rock the vessel to evenly distribute the cells. Label your flask and place it in the incubator, with the most common conditions being 37 degrees Celsius with 5% CO2. You should monitor your cells once every day to assess their growth and overall health. We can do this with a microscope, an inverted phase contrast setup. What you're looking for is how much of the flask surface is occupied by the cells, also known as confluency, and the absence of any contaminants. When about 80% of the surface is covered by cells, they should be subcultured. Many of the cell lines that scientists work with are derived from cancer cells, which are optimized to continually divide. These cells will grow until they have deprived the media of all of the nutrients, or until they have covered the whole surface area. When the nutrient media in the flask has changed color, this is a telltale sign that you've let the cells grow for too long, often resulting in debris and or cell death. We have to divide and subculture the cells in the flask into smaller portions with fresh nutrients to prevent them from dying. If your cells are adherent and attached to the surface of the flask, we have to chemically and mechanically dislodge the cells first. Most of the time, protease solutions such as trypsin EDTA will work just fine. Carefully remove the old media from the flask and then add enough PBS to cover the cell monolayer.
Rub the container gently to rinse the cells, then carefully discard the PBS. Prepare enough pre-warm trisome to cover the cell monolayer. And gently rock the flask. Trypsin should start working after 2-10 to 10 minutes. This can be in the incubator or at room temperature depending on the cell type. You can dislodge more cells by gently tapping the bottom of the flask. To activate the trypsin, add pre-warm media into the flask. Usually at least double the volume of trypsin added and gently pipette up and down. The cells are now resuspended, and a small portion of this volume can be added to a new flask with pre war media, where they will have more space and nutrients to grow. Ideally, you should seed the cells at a lower concentration than in the original flask and time it so that you don't need a subculture again for two to three days. A good point to start with is a 1 to 10 ratio of cells to media in the new flask, but this will depend on the original concentration of cells. We have a whole other video on cell growth and cell counting that goes through this in a lot more detail. Label your new flask with a date, cell line name and passage number, the number of times the cells have been subcultured, and from here the cells can be cultured for experiments or subcultured again for future use. You now have a constant supply of cells that you can use for all sorts of experimentation. You can add them to new flasks, plates, or 2496 384 well dishes for high throughput experiments such as drug treatments or cell motility assays. These experiments only work if the cell model layer is healthy. Check your cultures under the microscope every day, assess confluency and contamination. At the end of each session, you should remove all equipment from the hood, spray and wipe down with 70% ethanol, and turn off the hood. You should also turn on UV irradiation in these hoods to sterilize the work area when the hood is sealed. The UV lamp is turned on before and after each experiment. Cells are incredibly useful tools in biological research, and working with them requires practice, precision, and patience just to keep them alive. This concludes part one in our series on cell culture. Other videos in the series cover a more detailed demonstration of these techniques, growing bacterial cultures, as well as cell counting assays. You can find the links to all these videos below. This is the Biolab Collective. I'm Jack Wayne, and I'll see you in the next video.